you know, the danger of uh, doing things twice is that you will never do it the second time the exact same way you did it the first time. <laughs> but what I will tell you is that it's the same person <laughs> doing the covering basically the same topics. So I, I think, uh, um, so, so with this disclaimer, that the result that we'll get to in about five to 10 minutes from this point, if you later on compare it to one of the lecture videos and see if what I write here is exactly the same table as what you see there, I will tell you it probably won't be. With the disclaimer, I think it's good to see kind of two separate presentations, even by the same person, because um, maybe from judging, um, what you see me forget, <laughs> you can kind of see what's not as important. And from seeing the things that are covered the exact same way, you can see what's uh, foundational, what's important. So let me call this uh, just the uh, electrostatics review since that's what's requested and that's uh, what I will <laughs> attempt to do. So there is a benefit in doing a review that um, that you don't have when I'm first introducing the topics. One of the benefits in doing review is that we are not forced to, to introduce the topics in the order it has to be introduced. So we couldn't possibly start the, the week five with a discussion of electric field because in order to introduce electric field, we had to talk about force. And so we had to talk about Coulomb's law in that way. So the benefit in doing review is that we cannot, I can assume that you have seen all this at least once the first time. So in the review, I can introduce these formulas and topics and definitions in the way that makes more logical sense without having to worry about the chronological order. This is one of the reasons that physicists make terrible historians because chronological order isn't really the way we think. So now, as I'm thinking about electrostatics, really the, the place I would start is the, the definition of electric field, that electric field is defined by this relationship, that electric force, which is what we are actually able to measure in lab, is given by electric charge multiplied to electric field. This is the defining expression for electric field. And whenever you are confused or not sure about electric, what um, whenever you feel like you are losing grip on electric field, this is the expression that you come back to because <laughs> that, that's the defining expression. And, you know, I think I justified why I'm writing it in such a weird way. I'm claiming I'm defining the electric field, but it's, it's because I don't want to write, elect I don't want to imply that uh, electric force is more fundamental than the field. We believe that the field is the fundamental thing, which is why I want to start from the field and get to the force. <laughs> So when we do that expression, there are some useful formulas to have memorized. These are the electric fields of different charge distributions. The first is really what we introduced in Coulomb's law, electric field due to a point charge. Electric field, due to, uh, the magnet, mm, do I want to say magnet here? Uh, you know, let me give the uh, vector representation. The electric field due to a point charge is given by Coulomb constant times the charge that's producing the field divided by the distance squared and the vector points outward from the charge if the charge is positive. Um, so R hat is the radial vector that's going outward. Um, so that's the electric field due to a point charge. And in application of Gauss's law, we have derived these, um, well, two more formulas, but technically three additional formulas. This, uh, um, so there's the electric field due to a sphere outside the sphere that happens to have the same form as the electric field due to a point charge. But I have to specify this um, distance from the origin is greater than the radius of the sphere. 
Uh, once you are inside the sphere, then uniformly charged the sphere, then you have to apply Gauss's law to find the form of electric field. I won't write it down in this review table because that is where you actually should know how to apply Gauss's law yourself. That um, you should be able to use the symmetry argument to be able to argue for yourself. K Q and closed. Well, sorry. Um, <laughs> let me rewrite that I ran out of space there. Uh, so, so Gauss's law. Gauss's law is one of those things that's hard to capture in a review table. I can write down what the Gauss's law is. And really, this is a shorthand for saying, um, you should know how to use this, this plus um, symmetry argument. You should know how to use this to drive any formulas in any new situation that you may not have seen before, to the extent that symmetry applies. And uh, in, this, in a class like this, I won't give you situations where things are either not symmetric enough that you can't use Gauss's law, or if it's not um, some kind of um, arrangement you can build out of other things that you know about, which I'll get to actually in a bit. <laughs> so, so up, through application of Gauss's law, there are three more electric field formulas that I derived. I just wrote down the one uh, for the sphere. There's a, a second one due to a line of charge. So electric field due to an infinite line of charge is given by two times uh, Coulomb constant times the, here it's not gonna be a amount of charge, it's gonna be charge density because it's infinite line, the actual amount is infinite. So linear charge density lambda divided by distance r, distance from the line times r hat. And here I'm uh, committing a little bit of um, uh, notational abuse <laughs> because I'm using this r to mean the uh, mean two different things. Here this is a vector unit vector that's radially going outward from an origin. So it's uh, outward from a single point. Um, here, this R hat is radially outward from a line. So it's perpendicular to the line. Just to, you know, as you're remembering this, remember those differences. Uh, sometimes people do use actually different letter here to remind themselves that um, like it's, S is a common letter to use here. But in the end, it comes down to you have to remember what direction these things are. And the final uh, formula is the electric field due to a plane of charge. And that's given by, do I remember? Yeah, 2 pi times Ke um, times the surface charge density and uh, times the normal vector. And this is a, a, a interesting formula that doesn't depend on distance. That's a result that we drive out of application of Gauss's law. Um, so that's the summary of electric field formulas that you should have known. And the addition to this, uh, which uh, isn't a formula, but it's a, a principle that you should know, is the superposition principle. Because there may be situations where you recognize that you don't have enough of a symmetry. Maybe it's a charge distribution uh, that's a combination of an infinite line and a plane. Then you don't have the requisite symmetry to apply Gauss's law just directly. But what you can do, maybe you can figure out the, you can figure out two distinct parts uh, to which symmetry arguments can be applied independently. And then after that, you can combine them together. So uh, we do super, so, um, so that's kind of the short description of how you might be applying superposition principle. Um, I'll end this review with a statement that this is what a lot, lets me add some variety to the questions that I could possibly ask about electric field due to different charge distributions. Because without that, I, you know, it could be, um, I'm basically limited to what you have already seen, but, but once I can um, combine 
two or more of the things that you have seen, then the combination can get more interesting. So, so this covers uh, first two, two weeks. The, what we've been covering, uh, does this cover first two weeks or first three weeks? Maybe first three weeks. <laughs> what also covered under electrostatics that I should <laughs> write down here is the idea of a voltage or electric potential. So this portion here basically covers electric field. When we are talking about electrostatics, there are really two important concepts that are highly mathematical. There are things associated with them that you should remember, which is um, electric field <laughs> and electric potential. So I've been talking about electric field. So let me talk about electric potential. And there are multiple uh, binding places for electric potential, um, two different places. There's, um, you can introduce the idea of electric potential through its association with the electric potential energy. And this is the relationship that would uh, relate them together. Oops, I'm writing it opposite, uh, the other way around. <laughs> so the electric charge times the electric potential gives you the electric potential energy. Um, there's a, and uh, when you look at this relationship and this relationship, I hope that they look familiar because they are constructed that way. Um, the field was basically the version of a force where you could take out the interaction with the test charge. The electric potential is the version of the potential energy where you can take out the interaction with the test charge. Now, with the potential, I do want to say this is not how we define it. This is uh, one of the mathematical relationships that happen to be true. The actual definition of, uh, I'm trying to, actual definition of electric potential is done through this relationship. The change of electric potential, let's say going from point A to B, is given by the line integral of the electric field as a function of position along a path, that product with the path element. And the, path, the whole path is some path going from A to B. And there are some properties about conservative forces and fields where this actual um, integral doesn't depend on the specific path taken. So you can choose a convenient path. So, uh, so this is the actual defining um, expression for electric potential. And even though this is not technically the topic this semester, but oh, sorry, I always, and I think I did this in the prior video too, always forget a minus sign. <laughs> um, so this is, uh, although this is uh, done in analogy with uh, something we did or supposed to have done in physics 4A, which is how we define potential energy. Potential energy is done through the it's defined through the work done by conservative force. The change in potential energy is defined as minus work done by the conservative force or the line integral of minus the force that product with the path element going from A to B. So, so this is in the background and that's how these three things are related to each other. So, um, so with this, there are a bunch of formulas that are also again derived, that's good to know. There's the, the potential due to a point charge and it's in this context where I introduced the idea of universal reference, which is um, the, well, so let me write down the formula. <laughs> um, uh, electric potential due to a point charge or voltage due to a point charge as a function of distance is equal to the Coulomb constant times the charge divided by R. And here's a nice thing about potential, which is it's a scalar quantity. You know, when I was writing this down, I was wondering, hey, should I just deal with the magnitude or vector? Decided to write down vector. With the potential, I don't have to even worry about that because it's, uh, it's just, uh, um, uh, it's scalar. There's no direction to worry about. And uh, when I'm writing down this formula, I do have to specify this formula is true with this reference specified that 
voltage goes to zero as r goes to infinity. And you can see it here, you know, if r goes to infinity, v of r goes to zero. And the reason I have to always specify this either explicitly or implicitly is because it's a, it, it comes from here. It's only ever the change in potential energy that's physically meaningful. So it's also the only the change in electric potential that's uh, supposed to be physically meaningful. So I have to specify where I'm measuring my difference from. And I think with the uh, electric potential of a line and a plane, it's hard to write down a formula like this, mainly because these are infinite charge distributions. So uh, if I try to set this reference, it doesn't work. So whatever formula I write down, it depends on where I set the reference. So I want to try to capture that in a table. Um, maybe one last thing before I wrap it up here. Um, oh, um, well, two last things. Because <laughs> after I wrap it up, I should at least write down the definition of uh, capacitance. So one last, so the one pen ultimate thing, um, it's uh, the inverse of this relationship here because it is implied by the fundamental theorem of calculus and it's, I think that's the name of the theorem. But to make it explicit, um, you can actually get electric field from the potential. That's uh, really why it's useful to find the potential first sometimes. Because once you know the potential as a function, then using that, you can get the electric field. So for example, the X component of electric field at a particular point is the partial derivative of the potential at that particular point, you know, X, Y, T, with respect to X. That, that gives you the X component right away. So you can imagine doing this for y, t, to build up the full um, electric field. And if you have already taken multivariable calculus, then you might, sorry, I always forget this minus sign. There's a minus sign there. <laughs> um, if you've taken multivariable calculus, then you might uh, be able to understand this expression, which is that electric field as a vector is the negative of the gradient of the, the potential, I don't know if you call this field, well, potential function um, as a function of all the coordinate variables. So this is um, the penultimate thing. And the very last thing, which um, I should have covered because it's gonna be covered in your timed assessment, uh, which is the capacitance. And um, they're really the thing that would be captured in a, a compact review is the definition of capacitance. Capacitance is defined as, um, capacitance C is defined as amount of charge stored in some uh, um, arrangement, which usually involves two conductors. And you have positive plus Q on one, minus Q on the other. So amount of charge is stored. And there's a voltage difference between those two conductors. So take the amount of charge divided by V, that'll give you capacitance. And the thing that may be a little bit surprising that you should uh, know to expect is that this depends only on geometry. Plus uh, dielectric constant material property, but what, what it does not depend on is the voltage difference or the amount of charge. It always works out so that um, so if you write down V as a function of Q, there will be a linear factor of Q in the denominator that will cancel out with the um, charge on the numerator. So, so yeah, this is a like 20 minute review of electrostatics. Um, I, <laughs> I may have left out some things that I've covered previously, uh, but this would be a second version of the review that you know, if it's not word for word, the exact same thing that's in the other video, then it, will, it should cover, there should be at least 80% overlap. Yeah.